Amen. If you would turn with me this morning to the book of Acts, <clears throat> Acts chapter number 18. Acts chapter number 18. Continuing this week with our look into the life of Paul, the New Testament church, the acts of Jesus Christ through the disciples, just, just a whole multitude of things going on here, so important to, uh, as I've said many times, understand the history uh, that's taking place here, and we're taking a, a historical look with an applicable... applicable Tongue-tied Sunday, applicable meaning for our church today. And so we're here finding Paul in Corinth, uh, one of the, the major cities of Greece of the time, and, and this is where he's at. And uh, I, I changed the, the message, the title of my message uh, this morning, actually, as I was putting the slides together. Um, I had originally titled it, Keep Pressing On, uh, but... We'll get into that, but I changed it to means for the mission. Means for the mission. The way God provides for us to do uh, the things he calls us to do. And that's what we see happening here for Paul. And, uh, you know, life is tiresome at best. We can get wore out. And it, it should be. I mean, that's the way God designed it. That's why we have sleep at night to rest from the tiresome day that we had and, uh, you know, it rejuvenates us to be prepared for tomorrow, the tiresome day that we'll go through uh, the next day. I've been listening to, to the Radical podcast a lot here lately, uh, David Platt, and I've been enjoying some of the messages that he's been preaching. And uh, one of the messages, I can't remember even where the text was from, but just uh, this, this phrase stood out to me. He said he does a lot of speaking at men's groups and men's uh, uh, retreats and said that he always tells the men, you should go to bed tired. You don't go to bed because it's the thing to do at night. You should go to bed because you're wore out, you're exhausted from the day, and you just need to lay down and rest. Whether we're working whether we're spending time with our family, whether we're doing ministry, whatever it is that we're doing it, we should be doing it with 100% of ourselves, uh, basically to the point of exhausting, exhausting ourselves in what we're doing. I've got a picture in my office that Hale gave me a couple years back. Uh, it's got a, a verse in it that my dad used to drill into our heads quite often. It's Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And so life is tiresome. That's not an excuse. That, that's real. That's reality. We, we should be exhausting ourselves in all that we do throughout the day uh, to the point that we need rest. But not only is life physically exhausting and tiring, it's, it's also emotionally tiring as well. If you've ever held any position where you deal with the public, uh, you probably know what it means to be emotionally drained or emotionally exhausted. I, working with the customers at UPS, you had your, your daily customers, your, your businesses that you went to on a daily basis, and, and dealing with some of those uh, could literally just wear you out, get you to the point where you don't even want to Think about that time of the day and where you're going to be at. Or, or even when I worked at the trout shop, uh, you know, some of the customers that you have to deal with can just kind of wear you out. You, you, you're like, oh, here's, you see on the caller ID who it is calling. Or, or even, you know, whatever it may be, ministry. I love you guys all, and, and don't think I'm talking about anybody in particular here, but ministry can wear you out, dealing with people in ministry. Uh, if we're not careful, what I'm trying to get to is we'll get to the point uh, where we're just physically drained, emotionally drained. 
And that's what we want to avoid, is being like that. Uh, you know, when we get to that point, what will end up happening, we will uh, exhaust our energy trying to avoid those people that uh, emotionally drain us or physically drain us. And uh, whether we, we physically separate ourselves or emotionally separate ourselves, uh, if we're not careful, we'll end up building a wall, kind of a, a sense of protection to protect us uh, from that which drains us. And uh, we may even find ourselves like Paul, weary and worn, shaking our clothes off and saying, I'm done with you. Uh, he tells them, he says, your blood be upon yourselves. It's almost like he's saying, I, I, I'm tired of dealing with you guys. I'm tired of me trying to tell you the truth and you won't listen. You argue with me. You dispute with me. You rebuke me. I'm tired with it. I'm, I'm done with it. I'm through. He shakes his clothes. Let's pick up our reading in verse 1 through 11 so we'll, you'll understand where I'm coming from here. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, and he went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and worked, for, and worked excuse me, for by occupation they were tent makers. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he persuaded both the Jews and the Greeks. Then when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit, and he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And I'll stop there for, for the sake of our reading. Uh, what caused Paul to get to this point? To get to the point where he's shaking off his clothes, where he's saying, your blood's on you, I'm done with you, I'm going to the Gentiles, uh, you don't have to worry about me bothering you anymore. And, and then also, how did he get past it? We learn that, jumping ahead just a little bit, when he goes to Ephesus, we'll see that he goes right back to the synagogue, goes back to the Jewish people. And so, how does he get to this point, and how does he get past it? And I've, as I've said, I've, I originally titled the message, uh, Keep Pressing On. Uh, Paul wrote to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. He said, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now the wording there that Paul used in Philippians is, is very interesting. Uh, uh, he, he's using language that would relate to uh, the Olympians, the ones who competed in these Olympic games and and the running and the, the, all of those track-type events. And where he says reaching forward, it actually carries the idea of a runner putting his whole body, his whole self, uh, just exploding every ounce of energy that he's got left in his body to cross the finish line. And that's what he's saying. He said, I'm exhausting myself for the calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so, first, let's answer, or we're going to answer the question, how did he press on from this point in his ministry? But first, let's answer how he got to this point. I've already brought out life is exhausting. Life uh, is tiresome. It's, it's draining. But uh, ministry life is especially stressful, draining. All those words that I've used to explain uh, those emotional and physical tiredness 
uh, not looking for pity here, but just being truthful. I've got a couple of memes kind of to, to go along with what I'm, what I'm saying. If Dallas will put those up there, the first one, he says, Who says ministry was stressful? I'm 35 and I feel great. Or how about this one? First year of ministry, and the bottom picture, 20th year of ministry. And I can relate to that. There's a lot of things when I surrendered to preach that I didn't realize I was getting into, and I don't regret a minute of it, but just to be honest, it's tiresome. And any of you that do any type of ministry, I think, would agree with me on that. And so we've got to understand that Paul, he's he's been on this second missionary journey now for several years. The timeline that I was trying to put together said that Silas and and Paul left around 49 A.D., probably late summer, early fall of 49 A.D. They then arrived in Corinth. It would have been sometime after Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome, which, again, from what I could gather, would have been around early 52 A.D. And so we're looking at a uh, three-year ministry trail so far that he's been on. And uh, during this time frame... Uh, we have to understand Paul is reaching 50 years old. He's not a spring chicken. He's, he's a, a man who's reached prime of his life and, and a little past that. I'm carefully saying that because not many of us are spring chickens, and I, I fall into that category now. Uh, but anyways, during this time frame, during these three years or so, uh, Paul's traveled 2,000 miles by foot, and then he's traveled another 1,000 miles by boat and then add to that just the things that we've talked about the past couple of weeks he was beaten and arrested in philippi he was chased by the mob from thessalonica from berea Uh, he got to athens and he had to basically stand trial before the philosophers and and give reasoning for his beliefs and now he's in this immoral city of corinth now, we talked about last week when he come into Athens, he saw all the idol worshipers that he was, he was disturbed, he was angered uh, because of the idol worship and because of the unbelievers. Uh, we have to imagine it's probably the same, if not even more intense, as he comes into Corinth just because of how wicked of a city Corinth was. And so, as I said last week, Corinth has taken place as the most prominent or most influential city of Greece uh, over Athens. It's located on an isthmus that connects uh, southern Greece, which was the Peloponnese Island or the Peloponnese Peninsula, excuse me, uh, with the northern mainland of Greece. And so if you travel north to south, you had to go through Corinth. Uh, But not only that, it was also uh, a port for the, it connected the Aegean Sea to the east and the Adriatic Sea to the west. And instead of sailing the uh, almost 200 miles around that Peloponnesia Peninsula, the ships would come to the harbor there in Corinth, uh, and they would dock on one side. They would drag the boat across that four-mile isthmus on these wooden uh, slipways, put the boat back in the water on the other side to continue its journey. And so uh, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because it, it shows us how much of a commercial city this was it was a very important very influential city now with its harbors we've all heard the phrases phrases uh, he cusses like a sailor right well that's because sailors had a reputation of living uh, lives that were not clean and wholesome i'll say it that way uh, and so this, this town, the city of Corinth, was filled with, with those type of people. Uh, but not only that, it, it housed the temple of Diana, uh, the Aphrodite, the temple of Aphrodite, excuse me, uh, was at the city center. And I've mentioned this before, but that, that temple of Aphrodite housed temple prostitutes. To worship Diana, you go and do your business with the prostitute. And so at nighttime, these prostitutes would flood the city by the thousands looking for, and I'll use quotations, worshipers. And so it was a very wicked, very immoral uh, city. There was actually a term that grew to be famous for those who practiced that immoral and impure lifestyle. 
I can't say the Greek word, it's a really long one, but it, what it means is to live like a Corinthian. And so this was a very wicked city. And so we can only assume Paul's physically exhausted from his journey. Uh, he's emotionally, he's spiritually drained from the abuse, from the rejection that he's faced, the persecution. <coughs> he even writes to the church in Corinth later on uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. But now he finds himself in this most wicked city that he's been to yet. But here's the thing. Not only is Corinth very important commercially, it's also very strategically uh, uh, important in sharing the gospel. Because of the city's influence, because of its mobility, because of its diversity of the people, the gospel could easily spread in all directions from Corinth. It could travel, it could go, uh, it could be a city of prominence just like um, Antioch becomes Paul and Silas' uh, uh, leaving ground, their sending church. Uh, this is a very important, influential city to share the gospel. And so Paul has a mission. Share the gospel in Corinth. That's his mission that God has given him for this place. And uh, when God gives us a mission, he makes a means by which to carry out that mission. And that's what I want us to see today is the means for the mission. That means to keep pressing on. And, and as I've said how did Paul get here to this place of exhaustion? Uh, just life in general, just ministry in general. Now we'll answer, how did he get past it? Well, the first thing we see in the first five verses is those friendships in Christ. The friendships uh, that, that God has put in his path. And, and so God knew Paul would need friends to help him on this leg of the journey. Silas and Timothy, as we learned, they're still in Macedonia doing work, and so Paul is by himself. I, I, to me, this points to the sovereignty of God. God knew that Paul would need somebody there in Corinth to help him in the ministry, to help him uh, just with life in general. And, and God also knew that any Jewish rabbi was taught a trade, uh, and that's how they made their living was, was by doing their trade. And we see that Paul's trade was actually... Uh, tent making or uh, some translate that to be leather worker in general uh, so God knew what Paul was going to need he's going to need friends he's going to need a job well sometime back this guy named Claudius he expels all the Jews from Rome I believe God in his sovereignty put it in the mind of Aquila that he needed to go to Corinth because he knew that his messenger Paul would be coming through who needed a friend. And so we meet Aquila and Priscilla. Luke tells us that Aquila, he's from Pontius, and he and his wife had recently moved to Corinth from Italy because of that expulsion. They were tent makers by trade, which just so happened to be Paul's trade. And so Paul moves in with them, he stays with them, he works with them, and they become later on a very important part of Paul's ministry. Aquila and Priscilla become uh, key players in the ministry of Paul later on in Acts. We'll get to them uh, in a few chapters. But uh, then after some time, Silas and Timothy arrive. We don't know how long it took them. We don't know uh, exactly where they come from other than Macedonia. Uh, but what we can know is how beautiful of a, a, a reunion this must have been. Paul and, and Silas were very good friends. Paul and Timothy, Paul looked at Timothy as his son. Uh, he wrote two letters to Timothy that's in our Bibles, First and Second Timothy. These are letters of instruction and letters of encouragement to his son in the faith, Timothy. And so it's, it, it had to be a beautiful reunion uh, when they came to him. But not only that, uh, Luke tells us <clears throat> that they brought a gift uh, from some of the churches in Macedonia, apparently, uh, from all accounts, it points that it was probably from Philippi. But anyways, this gift was, was large enough that Paul was able to stop his tent-making trade for the time 
and focus his energy on sharing the gospel. So he goes into full-time ministry. And so uh, he's provided Paul both emotional and financial support through friendships in his life. Then next we see God's means to Paul's mission through followers of Christ. This is kind of verse 6 through 8 is where the, uh, you could say the straw that broke the camel's back for Paul. This is where he shakes his clothes and he says, I'm done with you. Uh, he was compelled by the Spirit, it says, to preach the gospel message to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ, but the Bible says they refused and they rejected, they blasphemed. As I've already mentioned, Paul shakes his clothes. It was, uh, that's a symbolic rejection and disgust with their actions, with their, their blasphemy. Uh, he also uses an image from Ezekiel's prophecy. It declares that uh, <clears throat> those who would refuse to repent were bringing judgments on their own heads. And then from this point on, we see Paul focuses his ministry to the Gentiles in Corinth. And Luke also points out that even in Paul's disgust with the Jewish population there, he, he finds encouragement through those who become faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Now he begins preaching from, house, from the house of justice, excuse me, whose house just happened to be next door to the synagogue. You know, you talk about placement. There's a great place to, to reach out right next door to the church that, that kind of kicked you out. So he's teaching in the house of justice. It gives Paul a place to minister. And then we also learn about this guy named Crispus, who was actually the leader of the synagogue. Uh, he apparently became a believer, became a follower of Christ. It says he and his whole household. And so God has provided Paul a means to minister. He's given him a place. He's given him a people to minister with. And so again, God's providing that means to carry out this mission. And then lastly, uh, we see Paul is encouraged by the faithfulness of Christ. Uh, verses 9 through 17, uh, where the Lord comes to Paul in a vision and uh, he encourages Paul to keep pressing on, so to speak. And uh, no doubt he's encouraged by his friendships. No doubt he's encouraged by these converts, these followers of Christ. But now the Lord is encouraging him through his words of from his words, excuse me, of faithfulness. The Bible says he spoke to Paul by a vision and reminded him of his presence. He says, "I fear not; I'm with you." Now, where have we heard that phrase before? Or I guess I should say, how many times have we heard that phrase before? All throughout the Bible, God tells this to Isaac in Genesis 26:24. He tells Jacob in Genesis 28:15. He tells Moses in Exodus chapter 3. He tells Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 5 and 9. He tells Isaiah. He tells Jeremiah. He tells Haggai. All of these places in the Bible, that's just a few of them, where God says, don't fear, I'm with you. And so the, the presence of God. Uh, we see also God revealed his protection. He tells Paul, he says, keep preaching, keep uh, teaching, don't be silent. He says, don't be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. The promise of protection. And we see that actually play out uh, in verses uh, 14 on. Let's, let's read that. Let's verse, verse 12, let's go there. When Gallio was pro council of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. And so <clears throat> the Lord reveals his protection 
to Paul. So the Jews, they, they drag Paul to the judgment seat above the proconsul uh, of Gallio. They're wanting Gallio to, to make a, a, a decree against Christianity. Uh, that's their underlying uh, intent of all of this. Uh, but we see that before Paul can even defend himself, uh, Gallio dismisses Paul. And so he lets Paul go. There's no charges against him. And here's what's ironic or crazy to me even. I don't understand why, but in their outrage, for whatever reason, they beat this guy named Sosthenes. Uh, some of the studies I did said that uh, being the, the leader of the synagogue, it was his place to bring the charges against Paul, and, and in failing to do so, they, they beat him. Some say uh, we know that at some point Sosthenes becomes a believer, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Sosthenes, our brother, so he's now with Paul. He's joined Paul. Uh, some say that that's the reason they beat him. But, but anyways, whatever the, the case may be, he takes a beating basically for Paul. And so <clears throat> the Lord's protection was upon Paul. Not only did he remind Paul of his presence and his protection, but he also made Paul a promise. He says, I have many people in this city. Now, Paul accepts those words to mean that there's still people in Corinth who need to be saved. They still need to hear the gospel. And so, it's just like Paul said in Romans, how can they be saved unless they hear? And how can they hear unless they have a preacher, somebody who shares the gospel with them and so he he takes these words of God as a promise that there's still people in Corinth who need to hear the gospel and so we see that he stays another 18 months there in Corinth and preaching proclaiming discipling all who would come to know Christ and so now how do we apply that to us today you may be saying well I'm not a preacher this doesn't apply to me or or we don't live in Corinth, we're not missionaries, whatever it may be, I think, I believe that this can apply to us both in our ministry, and you say, well, I'm not a minister. Yes, you are. Whether you like to admit it or not, you're all missionaries. God has given you a mission to share the gospel with those that you come in contact with, and so in a sense, we're all missionaries. But how do we get through these discouragements, this despair, this depression. We, we hate to use that word. That's a, an ugly word, but it's true. In life and in ministry, you can get to a place of depression from time to time and uh, get to that point where we want to throw in the towel in our mission, in our ministry. How do we get through it? By friendships. By surrounding ourselves with people who are like-minded, who... who uh, can help us out in our journeys. We all need Christian friends. I'm not saying we shouldn't have non-Christian friends, but we need to be sure that we have Christian friends, those who uh, will help us, somebody we can confide in, somebody we can trust in to give us sound biblical advice and not just tell us what they think is best. I've got a good friend in Mississippi that I usually call on when I, I get in these places of, of despair or whatever and, and, and ask his advice on things, and he'll tell me. He says, I'm not one of those by God people. Or, or, no, what does he call it? I'm sorry. Uh, bless God. He said, I'm not one of those bless God people who will say, bless God, if it was me, I'd do it this way. But he says, I want to look at it from a biblical standpoint, and, and that's why I like to call on him to to help in those times, but, but we need those friends who are uh, uh, biblically sound and they can give us biblical advice on, on what we need to do and how we need to handle these situations. We need somebody we can vent to. And it's amazing how God puts people in our lives that are there for that season. I always think about the Wilkerson's. Uh, they were here when we first moved here and and boy, what a blessing they were to me and my family in getting settled in here in, in Fort Smith. We could relate to them. They had kids that are our age, and, and we were alike aged. And, and so it was a blessing to have friends 
to help us out. So by friendships, but also by followers. <coughs> I shared last week with you some, some statistics, and I didn't have the numbers written down, but I've got them this week. 11 out of 12 people that you witness to, on average, reject the gospel. 11 out of 12. That's not very good odds, is it? One out of 12 people will accept. And on average, that one who accepts hears the gospel six to seven times before they accept. And so you talk about knocking those odds even further down. It's so easy to get discouraged with those kind of odds. You share the gospel 12 times, 11 times people say, nope, I don't want to hear this. They reject it. They they. Just like with, with Paul, they may even blaspheme us. They may uh, tell us to get away. They don't want to hear this. They don't have time for it. And so it's easy to get discouraged. But we have to see the big picture. We have to see it as a whole. We have to understand that that one person who may accept Christ could lead hundreds or even thousands to Christ in their ministry. We never know what God has in line for those who follow him. And so uh, what if we quit after the fifth time of witnessing to them when they needed to hear it just one more time? And my point in saying that is don't be discouraged by the ones who don't accept. Keep pressing on, so to speak, in your ministry. Don't be discouraged by the ones who don't accept, but be encouraged by the potentials of that one who will accept. And then lastly, by the faithfulness of Christ. He's, he's not left any of his people, uh, uh, he's not let any of them down yet, and he's not about to start now. He's always with us. Fear not, for I'm with you. He's, he's there with us through the highs, through the lows, the good, the bad. He'll not leave us nor forsake us. Now that comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, and a very interesting thing I come across. I knew this, but... But to actually put it down was very helpful to me. Of course, in English, double negatives are a no-no, right? That's what we're taught in English class. But actually, in Greek, double negatives are proper language. It puts emphasis uh, where necessary. And so, in Hebrews 13.5, it says, For he, talking about the Lord, himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There's actually two double negatives and a single negative in that, in that verse. And so it would actually read like this. It would say, uh, the Lord will never, ever, no, not once, never forsake us, nor leave us. That's beautiful when you read it like that. God's promise is to never, no, not ever, never leave us, nor forsake us forsake us that's a lot of emphasis on the never so God is always with us by the faithfulness of Christ when we feel like we're just we're wore out we're done we're tired we don't want to do it anymore remember that God is with us and he's not going to let us down he's not going to fail us there's people out in the world today who need to hear the gospel and it's up to us to share that message then we can also, again, as I've said, apply this to life in general. When we get in those times of despair, those times of depression, disappointment, whether it be with our kids, our, our family, our friends, co-workers, whatever it may be, keep pressing on. God makes a means for the mission that he has given us to do. So this morning, I'd invite you to stand with me as we'll, uh, I'll ask Jody if she'll come and she's going to play a song for us on the piano. As she's